Welcome back to the podcast, Chromies. John Sowash with you again. Today, I'll be sharing my top 10 links and updates for November 2024. It was actually a pretty quiet month. I was having trouble finding 10, but then Google dropped a whole bunch of updates uh, just in the last few days. So we've got a, a full slate of things to discuss and uh, chat about. Hope you're doing well. It's been a busy fall for me. Um, I had the uh, privilege of speaking at the Mass Q conference um, a few weeks ago. Um, and then uh, tomorrow, November 9th and 10th, I'll be organizing the My Google Conference. This is the Michigan Google Education Summit. Um, this is an event that I've been organizing for the last 10 years and uh, expecting 800 educators from across the state of Michigan to uh, join us in Clarkston, Michigan. Uh, it's a lot of work to put this event together, but uh, I'm happy to do it and hope that it uh, inspires teachers. This is a tough time of year. If you're feeling a little weary, you are not alone. Um, you know, the the time between um, you know Labor Day and Thanksgiving is the longest unbroken stretch of instructional time of the entire year. Uh, you've got a, a couple weeks left. Hang in there. Um, I scheduled the My Google Conference to give teachers hopefully a little inspiration, a little energy um, to help them get to that Thanksgiving uh, mark. And then after Thanksgiving, things to me usually go pretty quick. You've got Christmas and then all kinds of uh, breaks. Second semester seems a lot more broken up than uh, the first semester, in, in my opinion, anyways. So I hope you're doing well. I've got a few updates that hopefully will uh, interest you and give you some new things to try out in your classroom. If you're new to the podcast, welcome in. I encourage you to subscribe on your favorite podcast uh, platform, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or over on YouTube. There is a video version of this podcast. Those of you who are watching, hello. Um, I've actually been surprised how many people enjoy the video feed. Um, I am not a video podcast person. I like podcasting because I can listen while I'm driving or working out or doing lawn work. Um, so I prefer audio podcasts, but I'm here to serve. Whatever people want, uh, happy to give it to them. Well, let's go ahead and uh, dive in and talk about the 10 links for this month. We're going to start out with a Gmail feature that I shared over on Twitter, and people uh, really liked it. It's like, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's chat about it. So there is a feature in Google Calendar where you can schedule appointment slots. And a lot of instructional coaches use this. You say, I'm available Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to noon, pick a 30 minute time slot. Uh, you may have used this for parent teacher conferences. So that feature exists. That's not what we're talking about. In Gmail, you can now do the same thing. So if you've ever had that awkward conversation where you say, are you available Tuesday at one, Wednesday at three, go back and forth. Well, now you can do it right from Gmail. You can pose a message, look down at the uh, toolbar and you'll see a tiny little Google calendar icon. <clears throat> Click on that and then you can specify the times that you're available and send that in an email. Um, so this is kind of like appointment slots light. Now there are some limitations to this. I got a lot of feedback um, on the post, you know, good and bad. Um, there are some challenges with this feature specifically, you know, if you send the email out and then you add something to your calendar, the appointment slots do not update. So this is really designed for um, a one-to-one -one email. I'm sending an email to one other person and they're going to fairly quickly, hopefully within the next 24 hours, respond before I make any modifications to my own calendar. I've used it a couple times. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I mean, there's lots of other services that offer this type of feature. Uh, some you pay for, some um, are free. Uh, but now you've got it right within uh, right within Gmail. So if you're a Google Calendar or a Gmail user, this makes uh, a lot of sense. I did test it. It does work with non-Gmail recipients. Um, I sent it to an old Yahoo account that I had, and it just opens up in Google Calendar uh, kind of like you would expect. So give it a try. Next time you need to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with someone, um, you can avoid a bunch of uh, unnecessary emails. Next up is a new update for Google Slides that I'm pretty excited about. Um, it was just announced, so I do not have access yet. Google is adding a new option to add 
animated GIFs and stickers to your Google slide presentation. So this new option uh, will be in the insert image menu. So you click on insert image, and then there'll be a new one that says GIFs. Uh, this is awesome. I spent a lot of time going out doing Google searches for GIFs and then inserting them. Um, I use the Jiffy extension. This will just make it uh, simpler and easy. So I, I think this is great. Um, supposed to begin rolling out November 6th. I do not yet have access. Uh, it should pop up. This will be available for all Google users. It's not a premium feature or anything. Um, they've, Google's added a lot of features to the um, insert image feature for slides. Um, most recently, uh, if you are in your personal account, you'll have the option to use Duet AI, where you can actually describe an image, kind of like what you do in Canva. So it's text to image. Um, that feature is not available for Google Workspace accounts unless you purchase um, their Duet AI package, which is quite pricey. I, I am using it to test it out, but I think it's like 30 bucks per user per month. Um, so yeah, it's probably not something that uh, a lot of schools are going to spring for. At the moment, eh, I don't know if it's really worth it. I'm paying for it to tell you if it's worth it. That's uh, <laughs> my service, uh, service to you. So look for that feature in Google Slides in the um, near future. Link number three is something that we have known about for about two years. And Google is just now getting ready to publish it. Google Classroom Analytics. Uh, this was announced, again, I could look back, but forever ago, I think two years ago, they announced that teachers would have better insight into what type of progress their students are making. I mean, right now in Google Classroom, teachers are very limited. Uh, you can see if a student has turned something in or not. You can see if it's missing or late or submitted. That's it. You don't know if they've opened it. You don't know how much time they spent on it. Um, you're kind of blind. And that would be very helpful information. Now, there's a lot of third-party tools that um, can assist with this. You know, Classwork Zoom is one that I've mentioned in the past that gives you some better analytics on uh, what your students are doing. Google is promising to add this data in. So there's kind of two parts to this. There's the teacher part, and then there's the school administrator part. Now, unfortunately, I also have to mention that this is a premium feature and will only be available to users that are um, using the Education Plus uh, version of Google Workspace. So that's the whole domain, kind of the top tier um, plan for Google Workspace. We've chatted about this at length before. We are very rapidly approaching a situation where if your school does not upgrade, you're going to be a little bit frustrated. Pretty much all of the last you know, features that Google has added, all the cool stuff um, from practice sets in Google Classroom to interactive YouTube questions to a lot of the AI things are tied to the advanced education plus uh, tier. So be that what it is, um, you may have to have some conversations with your school administrators about um, if they're willing to, to purchase it. But um, anyways, here, let's take a closer look at this. So teachers, individual teachers will have a new analytics tab. When you click on the little hamburger on the left side of Google Classroom, you know, that's the one you pick to switch classes. There'll be a new option that says analytics and you'll be able to see um, more data on a particular student, how many assignments they've completed, number of missing assignments, their average grade, um, things like that. School administrators will be able to see that same data for the entire district. Teachers can only see their class. Admins, if they have the appropriate administrative role, will be able to see all classes and drill down into individual um, uh, courses. There is some back-end work that has to be done to make this all happen. There's a new administrative role that uh, your IT administrator will have to create and then assign to the individuals who have um, permission uh, to view all of that data. Um, I'm interested in seeing what data is actually provided. Remains to be seen how useful that data is. I mean, just the number of completed or missing assignments doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. 
Um, this feature will be rolling out in the month of November. But like I said, your admin will have to do some things in the back end uh, to make that all work uh, successfully. Next up, link number four is the continuing saga of YouTube <laughs> in education. Uh, when I was out in California at Google headquarters, um, there was a, a member of the YouTube team there, and I actually discussed this issue with him, and uh, it was admitted that, yeah, it's kind of not working well. We're, we're trying to make it better. We're trying to fix it. YouTube has always been a challenge for educators. There's lots of good stuff, lots of bad stuff, and Google has tried over and over and over again to fix or improve the YouTube experience for educators. Their latest effort is something called YouTube for education. And, you know, this is something that was supposed to be invisible to teachers and just work. Um, Google created a new domain called youtubeeducation.com. Don't go there. There's nothing there. The simple reason they did that is they were trying to provide a way for schools to block or to allow education content and block the rest of YouTube. Right now, the problem is that it's all in one spot. And so, you know, you, if you block YouTube, then you block all the good stuff. So they're pr trying to create this separate space, YouTube education, where you point your filter and you say, block YouTube, allow youtubeeducation.com. And it'll allow the good stuff and keep out the bad stuff. Um, and this worked with Google Classroom. So when you put a video into Google Classroom, that YouTube player is the YouTube education player. And you, you'll notice that it doesn't have the YouTube logo and branding. And there's no ads. It's a slightly different experience. You can still, still tell it's YouTube, but it's, it's kind of cleaned up and simplified. Well, they broke it. Um, when they implemented this new idea, it freaked out and broke a bunch of stuff. And so Google published on their Google Workspace update blog, this is the end of October, um, that they are disabling the YouTube education idea for the time being. Um, so if you are, if you're a classroom teacher and you have been experiencing weirdness in the YouTube uh, within Google Classroom, that is a known issue and Google is working on it. Um, if you are a school administrator or IT director, the previous message from Google was to update your filter to allow youtubeeducation.com. Now Google is telling you, whoops, we broke it. Please go back to allowing youtube.com until we let you know to switch back. Um, Ultimately, what you should take from this is it's a big mess. Uh, it's not going well. Uh, the YouTube is continues to be the the thorn in the side of uh, of educators everywhere. So um, there's not really much you need to do. Just be aware that there are known issues related to this, and hopefully there'll be a better fix and solution sometime uh, in the future. Well, I want to pause for a minute and uh, invite you to join me for the Google Certification Academy. Um, each January, I host this uh, virtual training and work with a group of usually about 30 teachers to become Google Certified Educators. Uh, this program changed my life um, when I started back in 2009. And I'd love to work with you on this uh, this journey as well. There's a lot of teachers. I think over 3,000 teachers have worked with me over the last seven, eight years. And we really have a fun time together. During the Google Certification Academy, which starts January 16th, I will walk you through everything you need to know to prepare you to take the level one and level two Google certification exams. Um, also, I will be opening up a new program called the Google Trainer Academy. Um, so you can only get into the Google Trainer Academy if you have earned your level one and level two certification. Um, and the Trainer Academy, which will happen in the spring, will assist you in becoming a Google for Education certified uh, trainer or innovator. 
Um, and uh, you can join the Google Champions cohort. Those of you who are listening, I'm holding up my uh, super cool medal and pins uh, that you earn when you when you complete these uh, these programs. So it's a journey. You can become a level one, level two certified educator. If you work with teachers, you can become a certified trainer. If you're primarily working with students, you can become a certified coach um, and uh, even a certified innovator, which is a great program. Google will be bringing back the in-person innovator academies in 2024, uh, which they have not had since, since COVID. Every cohort of the Google Certification Academy I have hosted has sold out. Um, I specifically designed this to work with smaller groups so I can give individual attention. So if you are seriously interested, I would encourage you to join the wait list now. I will be opening up registration later in November and the people on the wait list get first opportunity. This is not a free training. Uh, it is very time intensive for me. I spend many months preparing um, material so that you um, have a guaranteed chance of success. That that you, That's the John Sowash guarantee. If you sign up for the Certification Academy, you will pass uh, your level one, level two uh, test. I'll work with you until you do. So the wait list is open. You can head over to geducator.com uh, to add your name to the wait list, and then you'll get an email as soon as registration opens in the next, uh, next couple of weeks. The cohort, it, it's virtual. I have people from all over the world who join, from the United States, Canada, um, Asia, Middle East, all over the place. Um, starts January 16th. They are evening sessions. Um, for those of you in the U.S., you can join after school. And then they are recorded. So if the time doesn't work out for you, you can always watch the recordings and you get um, direct access to me, to ask questions, and uh, meet with me, and uh, get your level one, level two certification. So um, thanks for considering that. Pass that on to the teachers at your school. I know there's a lot of tech coaches who listen. You are already a certified trainer, a coach, an innovator. Um, and uh, if you want to share this information with your teachers, I'd love to work with them in the coming months. All right, back to our 10 links for this month. Um, next up, we have a new smart chip for Google Sheets. Uh, smart chips, if uh, you haven't been following along, are little connected mini applications or features that allow you to enhance your use of um, your smart chips in Google Docs, Google Sheets, uh, some in Gmail. Um, then the new one is a rating smart chip. Um, this used to require some somewhat sophisticated coding, uh, but now you can add um, a star rating, like five star uh, rating in um, to your Google Sheet. This has some interesting applications if you're doing any kind of voting or ranking type activities in your classroom. Um, I just got a, an email from um, my buddy Ben Collins, who is a Google Sheet genius. And Ben has a bunch of, uh, every week he sends out a Google Sheet tip. And uh, his tip from this past week was on the new ratings. And you can see here, you can just quickly insert rating, and then you can click the stars uh, to vote and rank things. So uh, it could be interesting. A lot of potential options for this. I could even be, see it being used for rubrics um, for teachers just to quickly click on the stars to indicate um, the mastery level of a particular rubric. So check out Ben if you're interested in some specifics. Uh, but yeah, I just go to insert and then you'll see the new um, option for inserting a rating or voting chip. It's under the uh, the smart chip um, option. So here's a insert menu in Google Sheets, down to smart chips, and uh, you'll see all the options, including, there it is, the new rating one. That's it, no sp special coding uh, necessary. Now I just mentioned Ben Collins, who is my go-to guru for Google Sheets. And I'm actually gonna skip down, oh uh, yeah, look at me. I'm uh, very organized. Uh, the next link um, that I want to share with you is a really great course by Ben called the AI Playbook for Google Sheets. Now, I am okay at Google Sheets. I know enough to be dangerous, uh, but I am certainly not uh, a Google Sheet 
wizard. <laughs> um, certainly not like Ben or Alice Keeler or many other people. Uh, Google Sheets is you know not my favorite. I think in words, not numbers. So I was very interested in this course from Ben Collins. Um, he just released it. The premise of the course is how can tools like Chat GPT and Google Bard help analyze data and create complex formulas um, and scripting. I was one of the first people to sign up, um, so I got it at a discount. The course currently is 198. Um, it was a hundred percent worth it. Great videos. They're really short, very actionable, and I'm actually working right now on a curriculum mapping project um, for um, Lansing um, Archdiocese. Uh, so a collection of Catholic schools, they're mapping their curriculum together. And they've um, asked me to assist them in building some custom spreadsheets to organize and map their instructional content. And I am using the content from Ben's course to assist me with some somewhat complex formulas. So a teacher types in a, a standard and it automatically you know says this one has been covered and calculates a percentage completed. It does some interesting things. I definitely would not have the idea to do what I'm working on without Ben's course. So if you're interested in a very practical illustration of how to use AI as a professional, I'd highly recommend uh, this course. And I am hoping to have Ben on the podcast. Um, he and I have been friends for, for many years. Um, our circles kind of overlap a little bit. So I'm trying to schedule him on the podcast to uh, give us some insights in how tools like Google Bard and ChatGPT can be used uh, with Google Sheets. We're going to stick with the AI topic. You'll have to let me know if you are sick of hearing about artificial intelligence. It definitely does seem to be dominating the news, conferences, podcasts, everything. However, it's pretty significant, so it's it's hard to ignore. Um, at the Mass Q conference that I attended in uh, late October, all of the AI sessions were completely packed out. Um, at the Google conference that I'm hosting um, the next couple of days, we have, I think, six AI-focused sessions. I fully expect those to be uh, packed as well. I've been doing a lot of discussion on AI on um, my Wednesday webinars. Uh, those of you who are uh, subscribed to that have uh, gotten a, a a steady dose of AI, and that's going to continue here as well. So we've got, you know, um, Ben's great course. That's something you can check a look at, take a look at. Um, but to go to the other side of AI, the negative side, there is a lot of concern about AI content that is false, misleading, or confusing. Um, and image creation is part of that. Um, we've already seen examples of images that purport that something has happened or occurred, which are completely false. Google is attempting to combat that with a new feature that will allow you to click on an image and see if that image, where it came from. Um, it's uh, a feature of Google Lens. Uh, that they're adding. So when you do a Google image search, uh, let me try to do one uh, right now. I'll go to Google. Uh, I'm going to type in puppies. That's always what I search for because it's it's safe. I'll go to Google images. When you open up an image, there will be a little button that says about this image. And this will assist you in trying to figure out where this image came from. How long ago did this image appear on the web? Um, who owns it? Things like that. So let's let's try this. So about this image, it's going to do a, an image search. It's going to say a version of this image is at least five years old, and it shows me everywhere that this image um, has occurred, and if there's any additional notes or thoughts and metadata on that. This is something if you're teaching your students about uh, digital literacy internet searching, this is something that we are really going to have to be careful of. Just because you find an image doesn't mean it's true. And, uh, you know, several of the, the conflicts occurring right now in Ukraine and um, uh, Israel, definitely showing how images can be used to mislead people. Um, so again, 
anytime you do a Google image search, you click on an image, you'll get the little preview. Um, and then you have to click on the little snowman for that image and you'll see a little option for about this image. Um, a good thing for everybody, adults uh, and uh, students to know about. A couple more AI focused resources um, and tips for you that I wanna share. Um, I have been doing a lot of reading on AI and one of the ways that I've been keeping up to date is by saving images, uh, saving articles to the pocket Chrome extension. Now I almost hesitate to put this um, resource in the podcast because pocket is not new. It has been around forever. Um, it might be one of the original Chrome extensions, um, but it's a very simple thing. You go to an article, you click on the Chrome extension and it saves it for you. I then have the pocket app on my phone and in the evenings when I'm, you know, have a few minutes, I'll open up uh, pocket and all those saved articles are there. This happens to me a lot because, you know, I'll see something on Twitter or, you know, just my, my browsing and I want to read it, but I don't have time um, at the moment. So saving it to pocket gives me a list of here are the things that I'm interested in, in reading. One of the articles that I saved to pocket is my next link. I have doing, been doing a lot of reading on AI, um, not education necessarily, but um, just in general, uh, a lot of information on uh, AI in, in different fields. There was a really interesting article um, titled um, Language is the New Paintbrush. And the, this article was uh, interesting because it, it specifically talks about the new image generator um, tools. So describing an image and then AI will create it for you. Your ability to do that effectively is in large part require you have to have a good language um, you have to know how to describe that image effectively if you are an art teacher this is a really interesting um, article to um, share with your students because it really shows how art education can be very useful in developing the right uh, right languages um, there's a new word that I did not know that I've been using uh, since I read this article, um, and that is head cut. Um, I did not know this. If you've ever read the Wall Street Journal, they have a very unique visual style that kind of uh, hand, uh, pen drawing style with the little dots. That is officially, it's called head cut. And if you know that style of drawing, you can describe what you're looking for, and then the AI um, will create that for you. So this article about language is the new paintbrush walks through the process of using AI to create a logo and the various iterations um, that you go from, <clears throat> you know, say, okay, we want, um, we want a logo that features a pair of work boots, but you know, that's too, it's not specific enough. We need to go um, more specific. So we want a black and white drawing. And eventually we get down to the specific language that is used. So if you're an a, a art teacher, a language arts teacher, this is a very interesting article that shows the importance of language. And this is one of the articles that I pushed over to Pocket and then uh, read in the evening um, while we were uh, sitting around in the living room as a family. So if you haven't used the pocket extension, check it out. It's free. It's easy. And uh, yeah, it's helpful if you like to uh, read current event stuff. All right. I've got one more link to share with you this month. One final AI um, link. This is an article that I wrote called Create Your Personal AI Assistant. Um, and this can work for anything, but I specifically wrote the article um, in the context of an elementary educator. Um, I wrote this article after reading the previous article we mentioned and doing a lot of uh, reading on AI. And I realized that you can train Google Bard or ChatGPT with a series of directives to get more specific, useful answers. Um, the problem is that it gets annoying to have to constantly be saying, I am a, you know, an elementary teacher. I am creating a lesson for a third grade classroom. It's, it's annoying to do that every single time. So what you can do is create a new chat conversation 
and say something like this. You are a chatbot for generating lesson ideas for a kindergarten classroom. I will provide you with a target letter or theme and you will generate lesson ideas that are appropriate for a kindergarten classroom. You may suggest ideas that require the use of a Chromebook or hands-on craft ideas, which involve paper, pencil, scissors, stickers, etc. You give it that directive and then you save that conversation and it will remember the previous directive so that you don't have to re-explain yourself every single time. Now, obviously you'll want to modify my directive with your specific classroom situation, the grade level that you teach, what type of resources you have in your classroom. Do you prefer hands-on or digital activities? How long are your lessons? Do you have any students with you know special learning needs or ESL students that should be considered? Build all of that into your initial statement, and then you'll get much more specific responses from Google Bard or Chat GPT um, when you ask it various questions. Um, sometimes the AI kind of forgets what it's doing. And so you may have to re uh, remind it and say, hey, remember, you need to be sharing lesson ideas and I'm interested in, you know, uh, <laughs> a uh, list of the causes of the Civil War. I just need lesson ideas. Um, and, and you can, again, pin that conversation in either ChatGPT or Bard um, and come back to it. So I have multiple pinned conversations going. I've got one for social studies, one for kindergarten. Um, I talked to you about that uh, curriculum project I'm working on. I've got um, uh, an option for that as well. And so I just keep going back to those conversations um, and reopening them and continuing them. It's best to kind of separate your conversations or your topics into separate conversations so that the AI is kind of focused on one task at a time. Uh, so if you teach multiple class or multiple preps, you'd want to create um, several pinned conversations. Try that out. Let me know what you think if you have success doing that. I've been really exploring and spending a lot of time working with AI, trying to get the most helpful information possible. Honestly, there is definitely a learning curve. Sometimes I think I spend more time using it than it's helping me, um, but I think there are some potential advantages and that's my job. That's what I'm here for. I'm trying to figure out what are the best applications for these tools um, so that you as a teacher can save time and uh, do your best, uh, best work with your students. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of the Chromebook Classroom podcast. Uh, if you're interested in the Google Certification Academy, make sure you join that wait list before I open up registration later in the month. Um, I also want to give a shout out to some listeners that I met when I was uh, visiting uh, California. So a shout out to Carla Haven and Sue Grammatico, uh, who both listen to the podcast. Um, Sue listens on her drive to and from school in South Dakota. Thank you, Sue, for listening. It was great to meet uh, you uh, and Carla, you as well, uh, over in, uh, in Sunnyvale. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for uh, being a part of my podcasting community. Well, everybody, I'll be back here uh, again with another episode of the Chromebook podcast, uh, helping you find the best resources for using Chromebooks in your classroom. Take care.